We're here today with Dr. Ryan Witt, a koala expert. What's the story? Where are we at with koalas? Yeah, so koalas were recently uh, uplisted from vulnerable to endangered. And this has come about, I suppose, from uh, a long history of impact on the koala populations of New South Wales, Queensland, and the ACT. Uh, particularly, this came about from, from I guess, colonization to present through habitat clearing, um, development in, in areas where, where koalas want to live and we want to live too. And, and this, is, this is a multitude of different industries that have an impact, such as agriculture, um, you know, development, building roads, um, and, and all these types of infrastructure that we need to you know, sustain our way of life. So it's not fear-mongering to say that unless we have a proper government policy towards development, the koalas may, as predicted, become extinct by 2050? Yeah, that's, that's a certain possibility um, there, uh, where I think in New South Wales in particular, we saw a parliamentary inquiry um, a year or so ago that found that koalas, without intervention of some sort, whether that be conservation intervention or a change of policy in certain areas, um, that we could be facing an extinction in New South Wales by 2050. So there are no koalas in Tasmania or WA or Northern Territory, right? Correct. How many koalas are there in the whole of Australia right now? <laughs> I know that's a big question, but can, yeah. can, we, can we have a stab at it? We can't, actually. Um, that's a really difficult thing to say. So it's part of my research here at the University of Newcastle. We um, are actually trying to find that out. Uh, so we do a lot of the drone thermal imaging, looking for koalas to assess the baseline number that we actually have in Australia. Because koalas are so cryptic, um, and the populations are declining across a lot of their range, it makes it hard for us to, to easily find animals and then quantify how many we actually have. So there are other ways that we can find out how koalas are going and, that, and, and other ways that we've been assessing this over time. For example, we can do what's called an occupancy analysis, basically koala presence or absence. So when koalas are really hard to find, we can go into their habitat and look for signs that they're there, um, whether that be finding actual animals because we've come across them, uh, or looking for their scats, which is like koala poo, and, yeah. and, de and determining whether they're using that habitat at all. And then over time, we can model uh, whether or not we're seeing koalas in those habitats um, and build a trajectory, I suppose, about how that population is, is going. So this is based on your scat test to date, and now you've got drones as well in the air looking for... For actual animals. For actual animals. Yeah. But the scat test is showing that koala populations are in decline generally or in some specific yeah. development zones? I would say that, well, over the 200 years, yeah. all populations are probably in some form of decline. Right. Um, the, there's been huge range reductions mm. um, for koalas. But, you know, in the last 10 years, we're seeing um, that a lot of, there are some populations in New South Wales that are, I would say, stable. Uh, and th those are more stronghold populations um, in terms of their number, that is. And then we're seeing in other areas that are particularly on the coast uh, where, where there's this multitude of pressure, which has is, which is come about from, from development, roads, you know, dog attacks, disease, all, all coming together to imperil koala populations. Um, we see that in coastal areas like Port Stephens. Um, we see it in Port Macquarie. And, and I would say that this is a very similar situation for a lot of coastal towns up, up the coast. Well, there's a terrific outcry at the moment, of course, in specific developments like Lendlease has a big development in Western Sydney, and that mm. apparently is going to be built, proposed to be built on Corolla. So there's a huge environmental backlash against that. So we'll no doubt see more of, of these, this outcry from people concerned about natural habitats. But what about, um, why can't you just pick them up and move them? Yeah, koalas, translocation science or moving koalas from population to population is really untested at the moment. Um, and that's because koalas have a really sensitive microbiome. So they have a, a gut microbiome that's sensitive to the trees that they eat in, in their area. Um, and so what we see and what we have seen when, when you move koalas is, is that it can really impact their health. Mm. Um, some koalas that get moved might, might, might die because the leaves, um, the leaf chemistry and nutrients isn't right for them. Um, and you know that's 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 on, on on one hand, and then strangely or oddly enough, we see um, introduced population down on Kangaroo Island, and it goes gangbusters, mm. and and there are no predators, and you get a lot a lot, a lot of koalas there, um, and it's I guess at the moment delineating between 
why that happens sometimes and then why we can't do that elsewhere or if we can how do we how do we actually put the processes in place and the right processes to be able to move koalas easily so if we had to have a stab at the number of koalas in australia what would it be uh, i think I've, I've seen a couple of numbers around um for not for not for australia but i think for new south wales um sort of being 25 to 40,000 koalas uh, compared to millions and millions of kangaroos, have, for instance. That's yeah, right, and, yeah. and you know millions and millions of koalas that would have been here 200 or so years ago. Um, so, so we do know that the population is diminishing. We do. And they're not big breeders. So how many? How, what's the average per family? Uh, koala will breed on average once it becomes reproductively able. It'll breed once a a year. They'll conceive about 60 to 70 percent of the time. Mm. They'll have one young. Um, yeah. And that young will then stay with them, you know, for a, a better part of a year before it, it wanes, and then they're able to have another young. So it's not as though they can have a lot of a lot of different um, young in a in a single year. Mm. Um, and this is why we're seeing that populations are so imperiled, um, are really struggling to bounce back from things like the bushfires that we saw in 2019, 2020. With the bushfires the most destructive um, event for the koala population that we've seen? Well, certainly in recent history, I think um, they, they've been a, a real, I guess, eye-opener for a, like, I think a lot, of, a lot of people around the country, um, particularly because what we see in bushfires as um, catastrophic as those ones were is that we get full canopy scorch, which, which means that koalas have nowhere to go. They're, mm. Their strategy in a fire to escape is to go up. In a flood, they're okay because they go up and, and they're presumably yeah. all right in floods. Is that correct? They can't, they can't yeah. swim though, can they? Uh, actually, koalas can they, swim. They can swim. They, right? can swim. they can swim, maybe not through flood water, but yeah. um, they sometimes go across a creek or something like that. Um, but in terms of the bushfires them, themselves, what we're seeing is, is you know, thinking about the whole history of koalas, we're seeing huge range reductions from 200 years ago for various activ human-based activities. Um, we're seeing, you know, development happening everywhere, including roads, and, and that effectively pushes koalas, especially in coastal areas where, where our, I guess, our density is higher. Um, they get segregated into these island populations where their habitat is surrounded by roads, and then a bushfire comes through and it traps them, and we lose a lot of koalas at the one time. Mm -hmm. Well, so in this in this great clash of civilizations, the koala mm -hmm. kingdom and the human kingdom, <laughs> yeah. uh, tell me about the role of consultants then, because clearly mm -hmm. well, there's a lot of money around with large develop, development companies, you know, like yeah. your Mervac Stocklands, your Meritons, your Land Leases, all the big, the big yeah. developers. These guys have got a lot of money. They've got a lot of political influence. Is the work that's being done by their environmental consultants. Mm. I mean, what's the matter with the process? Is there a uniform process for getting developments yeah, okay? There is. There is a uniform process. Uh, however, you know there are limitations to any process. I think um, consultants do a, a, a really great job at evaluating, um, you know, different projects under the legislation. There, I think it's worth remembering that their role as a consultant is to work for the client mm. um, and in this case wh whatever that case might be whether it's building your home in koala habitat or building a big development of some form the the goal is to work for the client to hopefully find a way to see that that development gets approved that's their job um, and they work under the legislation to to try and ensure that, that that can happen whilst also offsetting against the impact on on koalas and other threatened species so you're talking about offsets here. Do the offsets actually have to be in the same area, in the local area? Uh, yeah, there's a lot of unfortunate flexibility with offsetting. Um, at least, you know, uh, there has been historically. Um, we're seeing perhaps more out of, out of a social license than um, an actual process that, that, uh, that developments and consultancies are starting to gear towards uh, supporting local populations with having an impact, but you actually don't need to offset in the local area at, at all. So it's like sort of carbon credits or the oil and gas tax regime yeah. where you get your things here and you can go and use them somewhere else. But That's for right. koalas, if koala populations are not mobile, if they die, if they're moved, mm. then that presumably 
Is that the the, the argument that's at stake here? Or? Yeah, that's right. That's right. So we're seeing we're seeing that that in some cases developments are offsetting outside of a population that they're having an impact on. Um, the best course of action would be to redevelop on site um, and you know do habitat restoration activities on site to support the population that they're having an impact on if they absolutely must have an impact on it for the project. So colonisation has been with us here in Australia for 200 years mm. um, and we have a decline in koala population. We have a political process where they're saying koalas could be extinct in New South Wales by 2050. Mm -hmm. That's two minutes to midnight stuff if, you, if you're looking at the clock on a 200-year yeah. uh, 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 basis. What's being done to save them then? Yeah, I think, firstly, I think there's no question that koalas are under extreme amount of pressure at the moment to survive. And certain, you know, to me in the field that I work in, that, that, it is, that if we don't intervene, um, that it's going to be hard to maintain populations in the wild um, in, in some areas. How do we best intervene then? Yeah, and, and so there's a lot of different initiatives, um, some driven by the state themselves, um, where we're seeing a lot, of, a lot of good resources being put into koala conservation to try and get a handle on understanding just how bad things have, have gotten. And I think that's the first step. And the area that, that we work in that supports that is using thermal drones um, to, I guess, evaluate the number of koalas that we have in certain areas that are, that are deemed, I, I guess, strongholds or... Um, major knowledge gap areas where we're seeing not a lot of surveys have ever been done um, or on the other hand um, where koalas are really under the most impact such as coastal populations that you know are succumbing to development and um, particularly peninsulas where where there's few habitat and I guess land is at a at a premium. At a premium. Cost. How do you know yeah. it's a koala? How does your can your drone tell it's not a bush turkey it's ah, a koala or yeah, can they tell the difference? Absolutely yeah. so we've we actually have trained the, our pilots to be able to identify different arboreals. So we can, we can find koalas pretty easily. We can, we can find greater gliders. And it, you know, the drone's well above the habitat. It's 65 metres above the air, so nowhere near the koala or the greater gliders. And we can see them. Um, they come up like little blobs in, in a tree. And because a lot of species, you know, they go into hollows at different times of the night and koalas don't move that much, it makes it easy for us to go, well, we think that that's a koala and then we send our ground team out if it's safe to do so um, to actually go and, and, and visually see that animal um, and, and confirm that, yes, we're right, that's, that's a koala. And, and we've been quantifying different habitats throughout New South Wales um, uh, to try and model exactly how many koalas we actually have, have in certain habitats. Can we do, can we do a breeding program? Yeah, I think we certainly we certainly can, and I think the way to approach koala conservation isn't isn't uh, it's not going to be any one particular tool or intervention that saves the day. It's going to be a multitude of different uh, different techniques, uh, whether that be assessing how many koalas we've got in the wild as a first point point. We need to then understand the genetics of those populations, and then we need to understand from that how to intervene, and that might be through captive breeding, uh, and then releasing koalas. I suppose one of the things that, that we've been doing at the University of Newcastle is, is un, trying to understand what sort of an impact um, that a breeding program might have if it was set up um, and whether reproductive technologies themselves could have, um, a, I guess, a cost savings and genetic benefit for koalas over the long term. And what we actually found was was that if we were able to develop reproductive technologies, I guess similar to human IVF processes, where we would collect sperm from, from animals and then freeze that sperm, I guess, in perpetuity, um, we would then be able to potentially reintroduce genetics back into captive breeding programs that could support populations in the wild through release of animals. Uh, and that actually has major cost reductions for captive breeding programs because it means that you can hold less animals in the breeding program uh, because you know all the males are banked. It means that if you if a, a koala unfortunately has been hit on the road by a car and and has to be you know euthanized, um, that sperm can be collected from that animal from that animal and then put into the biobank. Uh, and then at some stage later, it might be twenty years later, that that animal could then contribute back to the population. And so that's just one technique that we think that we need to think about developing 
Is there frozen koala sperm at the moment or this is a proposal or? There's not frozen koala sperm at the moment. That's one of the knowledge gaps that we have to get across. Um, some colleagues have done a, a lot of work in this area uh, to date, uh, the mm. University of Queensland. Mm. Uh, but we've not been able to use that frozen sperm to, to actually, I guess, make a koala um, and, breed a, and, bre and breed an animal through artificial insemination. They have actually previously done artificial inseminations that have been successful in koalas with, with fresh sperm or chilled sperm to artificially inseminate koalas already uh, in, in tame zoo animals. And I think there's been about 34 pouch young that have actually, that, that have actually come out of artificial insemination in the past. So we know that these technologies can work and can be used to support captive breeding programs that, that might help bolster populations that are imperiled. One of the things that we see with assisted reproductive technologies um, is that it's, it's not a well-funded research, research area because it's difficult for people to see, um, I guess at ground zero, how, they're gonna, how those technologies are going to have an impact you know, next week, the week after. Uh, and the reality is that these technologies need to be well-funded to be able to achieve the goal, the end goal, which is to, to actually freeze koala sperm so that we have an insurance policy that mm. if koalas keep declining, uh, if we get bushfires come through, that, that we actually have already collected genetics from that population before we've lost it. Mm. And uh, that's a huge, a huge undertaking to be able to, to develop these, these technologies. We need, I guess, researchers to be focused in on solving some of these, these techniques, um, such as how do we freeze sperm, how do we build a proper IVF program, and how do we best integrate this reproductive material into those breeding programs to support wild populations. And these are, these are things that we have not addressed. So if you had yet. a massive fire like the one two years ago, again, mm. things would be absolutely critical, wouldn't they? Because if, you, if you're talking 2050 for New South Wales and you haven't yeah. even frozen sperm yet, then the countdown is definitely on, isn't it? It absolutely is. And, and what we're seeing, I, I think what we're seeing here is, is that, that we know this works in, in other species. We've seen it work in North America. Um, it took them a, a very direct applied research program when they had only 18 individuals left, which meant that there was a lot of inbreeding. Um, and this was in a species called the black-footed ferret, where they, they were basically on the edge of extinction, right at the last legs. And, then, and that's why they focused quickly towards reproductive technologies to be able to bank down sperm quickly. And they did this even before they knew how to use it. Um, and then the next 10, 10 or so years was, was spent understanding how they could use it so that that captive breeding pro program wouldn't become so inbred that they'd lose the species. Um, we've got a really good opportunity, I think, here with koalas. We've got enough left to be able to grab this genetics you know, now over the next 10 or 15 years and develop these technologies so that we never have to get down to the last you know, 18 individuals in, just in, the, in just the wild. Need, we just need to get the, the political will to, to get right. this done. That's right. So what are the biggest threats to the koala population in Australia? Yeah, I think it's, it's really uh, the primary driver, which is habitat, um, well, loss of habitat or habitat clearing. So property developers. <laughs> Potentially. Uh, any reason that, that we would lose koala habitat um, then, or, de or degradation of koala habitat, so catastrophic things through, through fire or climate change. Mm. Um, and then we have the underlying drivers, which are chlamydia and other koala diseases that are having massive impacts. Um, we're seeing koalas, a lot of koalas die, die on roads, so it's about understanding how we can manage populations and roads. Um, and then, you know, even, even in your own backyard, dog attack in, in koalas is, is a big impact for some populations. So property developers, dogs, climate change and chlamydia. Correct, yeah. <laughs> well, thanks for your time, Ryan. What can people do then, finally, um, to help the koala population? Yeah, I think there's a, a lot that people can do, um, whether that's you know being a, just a concerned citizen or, or whether it's getting out and, you know, if you notice a koala in the wild, we're reporting it, you know, on Atlas of Living Australia or New South Wales Bionet or, or any, um, I, I guess, reporting service that a government would offer. Um, also, you know, if there's plenty of local koala hospitals that people can volunteer at, and I think that there's a lot of good work being done um, by, by folks that are managing those koala hospitals. Uh, and, and there's also, you know, volunteering on, on you know, uh, different projects, whether they be scientific or habitat restoration based, that would really help.
Well, thanks for your time, Ryan. Um, there's more information about koalas and the koala crisis in the video description below. As we sail towards the election, we'll keep you up to speed on all the developments in federal politics. We'll try to get you the real story, not the exclusive. <laughs>